you didn't do the models. You're not about the modeling uh, on this. But these numbers uh, are making people nervous, not nervous enough to not reopen, by the way, which is an important point. What is your perspective on them? Yeah. Well, models that change numbers like this, Chris, often confuse people. But the fundamental core principle behind it doesn't change. And that's something that we've been saying all along. When you have a lot of virus activity and you know that you're able to contain it to a certain degree by the mitigation, the physical separations, the kinds of things that we've been talking about, gateway, phase one, phase two, phase three, and you start to leapfrog over some of these, you're inviting rebound. And rebound is gonna give you spikes and spikes are gonna give you the kinds of numbers. I don't know if those numbers, because I have skepticism about models, mm -hmm. about they're only as good as the assumptions you put into them, but they're not completely misleading. They're telling you something that's a reality, that when you have mitigation that's containing something, and unless it's down in the right direction and you pull back prematurely, you're gonna get a rebound of cases. And that's something that I've been talking about in multiple interviews, multiple time. It is tempting rebound when you do something prematurely. Now, you know, everybody sees you as the person who wants us to stay the course and keep with the social distancing and let's get the science right. Uh, but they don't also understand that Tony Fauci knows what economic hard times are about, uh, how your family came up, what life was like uh, for you coming up. You know that people are in need right now. You know money is short for them. How do you balance those interests in your own heart and yeah. head, that you know people are strapped by this and they're worried about their families losing whatever dreams they have. How do you balance? Well, Chris, I'm, I'm not at all insensitive. In fact, I'm very sensitive to the potential downsides of the kind of in, uh, economic crises that we're having, the suffering of people who are not working. I mean, that's something that, I mean, you'd have to be so callous not to really feel the pain that people are feeling. But what I do know as a scientist, a physician, and a public health official, that unless you turn this around in the right direction and try because of your desire, an understandable desire to get back to some form of normality, if the situation is right to do that, if you're starting to see things coming down and you start pulling back gradually and you have the capability of when you do get blips to essentially put the lid on them, there's nothing wrong with doing that carefully. The thing that I get really concerned about, despite this concern about what economic uh, consequences you might have, is that when you pull back and the virus is doing this, it's only gonna do that. It's not gonna turn around and come down. So there is a balance and you've gotta look at both sides of it. And there are, I mean, the United States is a big country, as you know, Chris, and that things are gonna be different from one region to the other. And I think what sometimes confuses people is that when you talk about pulling back under certain circumstances, there are regions, areas, counties, cities in which you can do that mm -hmm. safely now. But there are others that if you do that, it's really dangerous. And that's the thing you've got to be careful of. You are losing this argument, uh, doctor. Not to For me. Sure. You can beat me in your For sleep. sure. Um, yeah. But people are fatigued. Some of it is need, as we spoke, and that's legitimate. And maybe you know, you're the wrong guest, but maybe argument, uh, government should be doing things it's not doing to help American families. That's not your wheelhouse. Um, but there is fatigue. They want out. You saw the pictures from New York City uh, this weekend. Uh, when I went out uh, to shop this weekend, everybody was out there. A lot of people had masks. Uh, and there was some non-mask shaming where I was, but not in the parks. The people have had it. The seasons are changing. It feels like summer. It's been long enough. How do you combat people's willingness to accept more cases, to accept even more death? Well, you know, it's the balance of something that's a very difficult choice, like how many deaths and how much suffering are you willing to accept to get back to what you want to be some form of normality sooner rather than later? You know, it's something that people feel very differently about it. You know, myself coming from the vantage point that I come and seeing the danger in it, I have to, I feel I have a moral obligation to give the kind of information that I'm giving. People are gonna make their own choices. I cannot, nor anybody, force people under every circumstance to do what you think is best. The only thing that I can do, Chris, is to give the information 
based on evidence and based on experience. And that's what I've been doing right from the very beginning. And there are people that are going to be disagreeing with me, some of them rather violently in many respects, you know, telling me that I'm crazy, you know, fire Fauci, do this, do that. That's part of the game. I'm just going to keep giving you the information that I feel is necessary to make the decisions that I think are prudent decisions. People who think they're going to shake you up with their mouths don't know you uh, very well. Uh, the right. idea that it happened no. this fast, are you surprised that after the country really did seem to get it, that we have to stay home, I know we don't want to do it, but it's working, that it snapped back this fast? No, I'm not surprised. And the reason I'm not surprised, Chris, is because one thing this virus has that's really different from so many other viruses that we have experience with, it has a phenomenal capability and efficiency in spreading from person to person. This is not a trivial issue. This virus has enormous capabilities of spreading like wildfire. We know that. We've seen it in general, and we've seen it in confined situations. The Teddy Roosevelt aircraft carrier with the explosion of cases, many of them asymptomatic. The Diamond Princess, when you have people together. This is a virus that spreads as easily as any virus that I've ever known, apart maybe from measles. Mm -hmm. Measles is probably the only one that doesn't do it as well as this. And look, you know, you, you were at the vanguard of the efforts against AIDS. Uh, you know what it's like to have a viral spread and to fight to have a way to treat it and to control it. Um, so you're not new to this. And the reserve that you have here and the concern you have should be heated, but it's not because people want to get back and we'll just have to watch what the price is. And unfortunately, even though you're not pushing the reopening, you will have to deal with the consequences of it. Now, what I will not spend time doing tonight, uh, Dr. Fauci, is asking you about testifying or not testifying or questions about the messaging. Uh, I don't know why anybody who wants you in position spends their time coming after you about political questions. You're not a politician. In fact, in my experience, which I guess is about 35 years, you're a lousy politician. Uh, you don't make those decisions. You don't want to make those decisions. You testify where they tell you, and you won't if they tell you not to, because that's your job. Uh, so let's not talk about that. Right. I want to talk about something else that nobody knows. Uh, why do I know what uh, Tony Fauci thinks? I've known him a lot of my life, but I've never known him the way I know you through this pandemic. I have spoken to you almost without exception every day, and you have been calling me out of personal concern to make sure that I'm okay, that my wife was okay, that my son was okay, 11 o'clock at night, later, waiting for my show to end, Saturday, Sunday morning, the rare time you have with your family. Why? Well, first of all, because you're a friend. I mean, uh, you know, we have a professional relationship, but you're a friend. I've known you since, I hate to say it, since you were almost a kid. And the fact is, you were going through some difficult times. I don't think that the people who were seeing you on the show were really experiencing uh, or realizing how you were really sucking it up to look relatively normal. But when you finished the show and we would start chatting at 11 o'clock, 11.30 at night, you, you, know, you were wiped out. You, you not only had the acute uh, difficulty with a virus that was replicating in you, but you had some of the secondary effects, you know, the fever, the aches, the feeling washed out. And even when you're viral negative, you know, I was concerned uh, because you're uncomfortable. I mean, people look at you, you know, you look pretty good right now, but boy, you, you put on a great act in front of the TV because you were really wiped out badly. I was worried about you there for a while because we know, and I didn't want to scare you, I gave you the truth, that there is a period of time in some individuals when you look like you're recovering and then all of a sudden things go really bad. The reason why that happens, as you and I have discussed over the phone at night, is we're not even sure. We don't even have a full grasp of the pathogenesis of why some people do what you did. You felt bad, you felt bad, and then you started getting better and better and better. Some people, they feel good, they feel bad, they feel bad, and then they start to feel better, and then boom, they go downhill. We need to figure out what that is, because when we do, it'll help us to intervene to do something about it. And I so know that I that cared knowledge... about you. Go ahead. No, I say, and I cared about you, but I was worried about you. That's one of the I, reasons I why appreciate it. I, I appreciate kept you being gentle with me about it. But listen, I just want you to know how much I appreciate it, uh, not just from Tony the guy, um, but as a member of the administration. 
I know the administration wanted to make sure that I was OK. I appreciate it. I really do. I won't forget it. I always try to be fair. Um, but uh, that's something that, uh, you know, just doesn't go away. You know, people care about you personally and your wife and your kid. It resonates. So thank you for taking care of me the way you do. Thank you for giving me all the information uh, that you did. And the only reason I'm sharing it on TV instead of saying it to you, as I have many times in person, I want people to know who they're getting in Tony Fauci. Uh, it's not just TV. It's not just 30 years of excellence in the scientific field. Um, the head and the heart that comes together uh, in your body is the real deal, Dr. Fauci. And that's why people believe in you. It's not the science. The numbers are all over the place. Nobody knows what the hell they're talking about with this virus or what's going to happen. But they know uh, that where you're coming from is a point of concern in humanity. And I know that firsthand, and I want my audience to know it as well. It's never been more true about a public official than it is about you. So, Tony, thank you for caring about me and my family. Thank you for caring about all of us. I know you're worried as hell about where we're going. Uh, and whatever happens, we got to right. just try to keep ourselves together.